Welcome, everybody. So this is our new format at Railvolution, talk show from Seattle, Washington at the Weston Hotel. Welcome to all of our audience here, as well as the live webcast, all of you folks out there. Uh, we have some great speakers here to talk about transit and social change. But first, I wanted to start with my top five of, of social change. We have our experts here today, but I took some time to do some research and find out what are some of the current trends out there. So let's go for it. So integration of freight and personal transport. Ouch. Let's move on to number two. Even superheroes take transit. Diego, was this your idea with LA Metro? Yes. <laughs> Number three on our top five of transit and social change. <laughs> Cooking for your family on the way home. <laughs> so those guys look really hungry, I think. You might want to share. Number four on our top five list. Technology is getting smaller, but we're getting bigger and bigger. I think that's self-explanatory. <laughs> and number five on our top five list change in generational preferences. <laughs> so seriously, we have some great speakers uh, today, three from Seattle, three from Los Angeles, going to give us perspectives on a really wide variety of social trends. Um, there's a lot of things happening, and so we wanted to put the session together to touch on some of those really cutting edge trends right now. So I want to mention that if you want to ask questions, um, both for both the audience as well as the folks out there on the web. You need to text your questions uh, to this number, 213-703-5491. Um, Elizabeth's going to be filtering the questions and um, asking them to the panel as we go through this 90-minute session. So please uh, get your phones out and text as you have questions. There will be an opportunity to ask questions to each panel panelist individually and then at the end of each of the two sessions. So our first panelist today is Claudia Monterosa. Uh, she is the Planning and Policy Director for the LA Housing Authority. Uh, Claudia has provided leadership as well for the Los Angeles Neighborhood Initiative and the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. Let's all give a welcome to Claudia Monterosa. Thank you so much for coming today. So Claudia, I have brought some slides with her to provide some background on the great stuff that she's doing down in Los Angeles. Yeah, so I want to provide a little bit of a context uh, as to how we're framing uh, these two case studies. I'm going to be going over two case studies. We just recently adopted uh, the first uh, transit-oriented consolidated plan for the city of Los Angeles. And under this consolidated plan, which really manages uh, uh, for the next five years, uh, four funding sources from HUD, which is CDBG, HOME, ESG and HAPA funding. So I, we often ask ourselves, what is it that the city can do, can only do? And in that context, we're taking a look at what's happening in terms of transformation in our neighborhoods and how we can best align, strategically align our resources, increasingly limited resources, and how can we be innovative? So I'm going to talk really briefly about Chinatown and Highland Park. These are small neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And we're going to go over two different indicators. What is the story before, uh, behind household income? Well, you're going to see this is a trend over three decades. And you'll see in the 2010, which is the uh, green bar, you will see that house, household income is actually increasing. Now we have actually an increase in the $150,000 income bracket over the um, last 10 years, where in 1990 you didn't see that. And you're seeing a retraction in the lower income um, bands. For Highland Park, you see actually a trend of where you see uh, an increase in the same income bracket at the $150,000 and also at the between fifty dollars and $100,000. So um, of note, in, in the Chinatown area, there are actually 92 households that are making over $200,000 a year. Let's go to the next slide. So what is this income, how does this income relate to actually the rental rates? 
In Chinatown, we're seeing an increase in the over $1,000 rental market rates. And you see that in the bar there for the $1,000 um, bar chart there. And you see that the rental markets around the 750 range are increasing exponentially in the Chinatown area. Now this area is mostly uh, made up of renters, about 96% of the people that live here are renters. In Highland Park, we have a different story. You have a combination of renters and homeowners. It's kind of a 40-60 split, 60% um, being renters. And what you see here is uh, also an increase in the um, rental rates for over $1,000 um, in rent. So. I want to go back to Chinatown, for example, in one of the new um, affordable, um, I'm sorry, mar market rate apartments, um, there is the rental rates, are, they are going for $1,800 for a studio. A two bedroom is about $2,800, and the highest one is going to go for about $3,200. You have never seen those kind of rental rates in the area. So now let's go to why, why this is all happening. In Highland Park, if you see the map there, we did a, an analysis of the tapestry of the area. This is using um, S3 Community Analyst um, census data, which is a combination of census and economic data. It kind of helps us predict what kind of people are living there and what, what is their market base. So in the blue area, you see that the, um, tr the uh, transgender, uh, the, uh, tr uh, I'm sorry, the transsetters, which are the higher income people encroaching in the Highland Park area, where this um, neighborhood was predominantly Latino, immigrant based for a very, very long time. What you see here now is an emergence of cafes and bars and nightlife and just different types of businesses that were not available before. So you see um, an emergence and combination of a panaderia with high end coffee. You have um, the introduction of mixed income ha um, affordable housing and af uh, rental rates, and you have a yoga um, storefront, you have people moving from New York. So this is capturing right now what's happening in this, in this neighborhood. And in Chinatown, we're trying to anticipate change as much as possible. We have an opportunity here to actually um, create affordable housing. And in fact, we use our neighborhood stabilization program funding dollars to uh, invest on a new project that you see here. I don't know if you can point to the Homeboy Industries and the uh, Gold Line Station. And the bottom line, the bottom picture. In the bottom picture down here. Right, that one. So that was a newly opened um, senior housing with an interest for, for, for seniors to have an art in interest. It's a live work space, and it's all affordable housing. And in Chinatown, we also see the emergence of other trends, like the coming of the Walmart in Chinatown. And we have the construction of uh, more affordable housing and also the um, GIA apartments, which is what you see here currently under construction. And this map is really telling you that there's a lot of exciting things going on in the area. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Cornfield Royal Seco specific plan in Los Angeles. It's a pretty innovative specific plan that was just adopted this summer, and it has no parking requirements, and it has a specially designed housing bonus uh, to really incentivize commercial along with affordable housing, and what we now have is four urban villages created for this specific plan. And in there, you have the NSP uh, investment as well as the affordable housing investment and the market rate development that's going on within close proximity of the CASP area and within a half a mile uh, radius of the existing uh, rail, which is the Gold Line and the Chinatown Metro Station. Thank you, Claudia. I think this is a great example of so many other things, too, that are happening in the Los Angeles metro area. If you'd like to send in a question for Claudia, which we're going to get to in a few minutes, please text 213-703-5491. So Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke praised LA's consolidated plan. Uh, Claudia, can you tell us about how far-reaching um, the plan is and what you're engaged in um, within, within the city of LA? Yes, this was a process that took over a year and a half. Um, 
well, actually six months to make, and now we're on our uh, second year of the consolidated plan. But how we started this was kind of groundbreaking. We took a data-driven approach to creating this plan, and we worked very, very closely in gathering this information that was both census data, publicly available data, along with proprietary data from um, different resources from within the city of Los Angeles. And we coordinated all the departments, including Bureau of Street Services, to figure out where the capital investment was taking place, as well as where all of our house, uh, public housing uh, dollars were going, where all of our homeless service dollars are going, where the, the social service delivery uh, systems were, were going. And what we did, it did is uh, find the intersection of where the opportunity meets the need. So we actually also mapped all of our existing affordable housing in the city, as well as all of our at-risk affordable housing. This is restricted affordable housing that's going to be expiring within the next five years. And in the city of Los Angeles, we have over 64,000 units of affordable, uh, restricted affordable housing, and, and within the next five years, we have over 15,000 of those units that are, are set to be expiring by, 20, by 2017. And so we established a data-driven uh, approach, and from there, we did a qualitative and quantitative uh, review of the data and came up with a plan that really aligned with the extraordinary investment that's taking place in the city of Los Angeles through the transformation dollars, uh, the, the, tra uh, the um, transportation dollars. So it's really how we strategically align that funding. And one of the things that we are now doing um, in the context of the comp plan is working with LISC uh, in doing a metro edge um, market analysis of 13 neighborhoods. That is a way for us to, by the end of, I would say, next year around this time, we should have profiles of these neighborhoods where we're going to have specific strategies of how we're going to align that funding, be it for affordable housing, be it a regulatory approach, uh, be it a uh, social delivery approach, um, so that we're looking at, at neighborhoods in a holistic way. We're not just looking at housing, we're looking at neighborhoods as a whole and how we can really uh, improve the social and economic viability of those neighborhoods. You mentioned a lot of housing projects, but how big really is the impact of transportation changes in Los Angeles as it relates to the efforts that you're undertaking, you know, with respect to your career and the history of Los Angeles? So one of the things that we do have and we're lucky to have in the city of LA is the rent stabilization ordinance. And our housing stock is mainly comp comprised of rental housing uh, units, mostly in the two to I would say two to um, 25 unit size buildings. Through the rent stabilization ordinance, we have regulatory uh, powers to provide protections to renters and also provide the rights and responsibilities for the owners. And so there are measures, there's, there are w ways that a, a tenant can be uh, removed from a unit. Now, the one thing that's really curious about the rent stabilization ordinance is that we do not set the rents, we stabilize them. So every year, the department issues a rental increase, an approved rental increase. However, what we found through research is that every five years, a rent, a NARSO unit turns over. So every time a tenant leaves that unit, it becomes a uh, decontrol. And so the owner can actually just set the, the market rate. So people tend to think that rent stabilization units are affordable. They are for the most part if you've lived there for tw 10 years, 15 years. But the critical importance of this housing stock, which is in the numbers of 630,000 units, is that if you do um, land use uh, provisions and you start changing the, the um, uh, policies around parking and also around development, you're going to incentivize developers or the owners that have been sitting on these properties for long periods of time and if there's upzoning and combined with parking reductions you're going to have this very precious housing stock at risk in those hot markets and so what we can do is enforce um, the RSO and continue to find innovative ways and so one of the things that we've done in the past is try to address uh, the condo conversion craze that took place in the mid 2000s. In the mid 2000s, we did lose over 15,000 units of RSO units during that time. But now we have put measures in place to hopefully prevent that from happening. Yeah, it's great, great to hear that. I know that that was a very heated mm -hmm. issue during the last mayoral election. Was the loss of uh, low-income housing 
but uh, it's good to see we're going in the right direction. Um, Claudia, in your opinion, how do you think that social factors will enter into the overall development of Los Angeles, especially in terms of the influence with private development and partnerships? I think it's going to be critical, especially as we, um, as we enter this really um, difficult period of time at the federal government where we do not really have local resources to address affordable housing or at the state level. And so we are forced, and it's a good thing for, for the city, gov for city government to think outside of the box, and that's really what we're doing. And so we are working with enterprise community partners, we're working with LISC, we're working with other entities as well with the, with the private uh, sector through our development of affordable housing uh, to figure out how we can best um, address the change that's taking place and how we can come up with creative ways to fund affordable housing or in our, in our what we, what's now under our charge is the human delivery service system. Um, at the beginning, I wanted to correct that I actually work for the housing um, and investment community deve development, uh, investment department. And it's a newly formed department that it was the former housing department with the community development department. And that came as a result of the redevelopment um, uh, loss that, that we experienced in the state of California. And so that organization, the CDD, <clears throat> was split into two. And so the other half went into the economic development department and the other half came over to the housing department. So now we actually have an opportunity to work with the educational system um, and the private sector to help improve the way that we provide human um, services such as um, increasing the um, income mobility of families that we serve through our family source centers. And we're opening that up through a re request for uh, qualifications and we're figuring out a way to place these family source centers in the areas that make the most sense. We can combine and impact that area with not just housing, but with street improvements, retail, and attract other um, economic opportunities in the area. Well, please text your questions to 213-703-5491 for Claudia Monterosa from LA Housing. Um, as those questions filter into Elizabeth here, uh, we do have a trivia for the uh, test for the uh, audience, but uh, Alex is going to read the question and pick somebody from the audience for a fabulous prize. All right, thanks. All right, thanks. So you get this delicious chocolate bar, get you through the <laughs> afternoon, just need the right answer to the question. Uh, vehicle miles traveled by people 16 to 20, or excuse me, 16 to 34. From 2001 to 2009, saw a decrease of A, 10%, B, 18%, C, 23%, or D, 30%. This is across the nation. National. Anyone? C, one, two. All right, Hal, I'm going to go with you. C. C. Alex, where are you from, Hal? Uh, Hal Johnson from Salt Lake City, Utah. Thanks, Hal. All right. Hal's correct. It is C. Winner from UTA, <laughs> Utah. Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth, do we have any uh, questions that have come through from our texts? Yes. Okay. It went and didn't make it exciting enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think so. Um, how closely, Claudia, are you working with uh, with um, Metro and other agencies in the region? And what's the, what's the collaboration and interaction between the transit initiatives and what you're doing for housing and livability? It's been tricky and it's been long coming. And um, one of our panelists, Diego Cardoso, uh, we've worked together uh, uh, through the MTA. But most recently, under the prior administ uh, administration under Villaragosa, um, he formed a transit quarters cabinet. And the housing department was a member of that transit cabinet as well as Metro and uh, the planning department, as well as the Bureau of Street Services and Bureau of Engineering and Department of Transportation. And so that gave us the opportunity to, one, come together as a city, work together for one on purpose. How can we make the city more transit oriented? And one of the things that came out of that working group and that inter-agency uh, uh, working group was a white paper on transit orientation, which can be downloaded on our website and I believe um, in other websites. And I can provide the link for that. And what came out of that was actually a directive that uh, instituted um, in the directive an equitable um, 
transit development definition that calls out for an integrative and responsible way and to embed values of equity as the city transforms um, itself in the next you know, 10 to 20 years. And so those components are having a really, uh, the, the right approach, a balanced approach. We ha haven't figured out what the answer is, that's why we're here. Uh, but I think that we made some fairly uh, good headway uh, in that direction. And so now with under our new um, administration under uh, Mayor Garcetti, he recently um, created a new directive that creates the uh, Great Streets Initiative. And we're working towards uh, also um, hoping to see a, a reincarnation of a, a similar cabinet that deals with the social transformative nature of, of what these transportation dollars, how they're gonna impact the city, just how it looks the people that are coming in. And what we're seeing right now is that if we don't put these measures in place through land use zoning and um, implementing and strategically investing our funding, both private and public, we're gonna be fastly gentrifying some of the areas around downtown, around the Westlake area, parts of USC. We already seen a lot of transformation in the area. And we've reached some fairly significant um, victories. Uh, actually, last year, uh, um, through a USC uh, expansion of a specific plan, we were able to actually secure $20 million from USC to address specifically afford the preservation of affordable housing within the um, CASP area, I mean within the USC specific plan area. And so there are different ways that we're working, not only with Metro, but also with the planning department. Um, one last thing, one particular project that's important to, to us, to the housing department, is the transit station area planning that's taking place. And the city of Los Angeles, through the planning department, was awarded a metro grant to do 10 station um, plans along the Crenshaw extension and also along the Expo line. And we have provided proprietary data that, that really provides a way to look at and analyze where the housing stock is and what kind of policies we should actually uh, implement in those transit uh, stations, such as parking, such as in, um, increase in, 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 in density, FAR, and um, streetscaping, all those elements that have a, a direct impact, not only on housing, but in the transformative nature was taking place in, the, in those areas. Great, Elizabeth, we have a question from the audience. Yeah, we have two questions. So, um, first up, is the income growth in Highland Park driven by the Gold Line extension? You know, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure if it's directly impacted by that. I think it's mostly by the, we have a very, we're lucky that we have a strong uh, market in Los Angeles. And we've been seeing the change in Highland Park for a while, but I think that the, the goal line has accelerated that. You have outgrowth from Silver Lake into Echo Park, and now that impacting Highland Park. And the goal line has certainly had an impact in that because people are falling away to be able to be more modal, more, more, more mobile. People are tired of um, driving their cars and they wanna be able to be uh, more um, transit friendly. I have lots of friends that have moved in and near Chinatown or Highland Park to take um, advantage of the transit. So I think some of it can be attributed to that. The other one is that people are being simply being priced out of the other neighborhoods where they could actually afford a decent uh, rent, and now they can't. And so they have to find other ways, other, other, uh, other neighborhoods, other areas where they can go. And the folks that are coming in are attracted by the growth in downtown. And I have some pictures that I wanted to show you before, but it, has, it gives you a flavor of what's happening in Highland Park. And we have a, a, um, an enormous amount of activity that's taking place on the streets in Highland Park, on York Boulevard, we have bars, we have um, different, different uh, coffee shops. And it's not the Latinos that are living there. We have the trucks that used to be catered to, to the Latino population there. And now they cater to a more sophisticated with uh, population that has a more disposable income. So now you have the influx of gourmet trucks from you know nice cupcakes to Indian cuisine to whatever you heart desires uh -huh. taking place in Highland Park. <laughs> Excellent. So let's uh, continue with our discussion, and we're going to get a, a, another perspective on um, housing and social change. We have 
the director of urban design at LMN Architects. Um, he's also a lecturer and writer on design and social impacts and uh, also has been an architectural critic for the Seattle Times. Let's give a big welcome for Mark Inshaw. Well, I've, I've got the li same limited amount of time here because you've got uh, uh, several other folks to hear from, but I wanted to talk about some sweeping demographic changes that are affecting this country and this culture like we have never seen historically. These are dynamics that are happening today and will happen for the next 30 to 40 years. One part is the story on the left, which you have all heard, and so I won't dwell on that very much, but to pick out one salient aspect of the baby boom generation, and that is that like never before, we are living longer and living healthier. We are living well into our 80s and probably well into our 90s over the next couple of decades. Well, what does that mean? It means one thing, and that is it's going to happen to every one of us in this room. Sometime in the mid-70s, in our mid-70s, we're going to lose our ability to drive. Either we will not be able to pass the test, or the insurance company will raise our rates. Either way, we're out of our car. We're no longer in that vehicle. We are walking. We are taking transit. That's going to fundamentally change the behavior, the preferences, the places that people live, the types of neighborhoods they're in, like we have never seen before. In fact, we are seeing already the advance guard of that group voting with their feet, voting with their mortgages, voting with their rent payments, and moving in to the cities, not out. That era is over. We have probably, by some count, have a 10-year supply of single-family detached housing nationwide. We need no more of that. What the demand is, is for housing within cities, within urban neighborhoods, that's where we were going. And that's where we're going to be, continue to go for the next several decades. So now turning to the right side of that spectrum, the millennial group. And my, I work with uh, two really very sharp people that are fall within this category of 21 to 34 um, of age. And actually, you can go to the next one. That's fine. <laughs> And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the older one, who's just turning 33, calls herself a senior millennial. <laughs> because there's actually some difference even within that age spectrum of values and preferences. You're a senior millennial too, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Or the reverse of that, whatever that is. Um, but their lifestyle is completely different from any age group that we've seen um, in this group previously. And that is, let me, let me highlight a few things about that. One of them was just mentioned earlier, the little trivia thing. Well, they're living smaller. They're living more compactly. They're delaying marriage by five years. And this has happened in just the last decade. They're delaying marriage by at least five years, delaying marriage by five, I mean, uh, childbirth by five to 10 years. That is not what we did when we grew up, we were probably marrying in our 20s, having kids by late 20s. They're not interested in that at all. It's not important to them. It's not a driving their choices. The other thing is they're not interested in driving. They're not interested in cars. Totally different mindset. In fact, the, the automobile manufacturers in this country are at a loss to know how to market this group to this group. They're not interested in that product. They're interested in other things in life not interested in automobiles. And that is across the board, that is nationally, there may be a few exceptions here and there, but that's a national trend that is solid. They want a bike to work, they want a bike to the park, they want to walk, they want to take transit. They place values on urban things, not suburbia. That era, again, is over. We're done with that. That's part of our history is gone. So now we're talking about city places. What makes life good within cities? And they're after this stuff like crazy. They want to live smaller and more compactly. That last image was what they own, piled in basically a corner of one room. They're mobile. They want to know that the next job, which may be in Singapore or London or New York or wherever, they've got to be ready to move. They don't want to be saddled with a 30-year mortgage. It makes no sense to them. They don't even get that. It has nothing to do with recession. This was happening 
well before the recessionary period. It's just that we've seen it exacerbated with the recession. People are living alone. That's the single most fastest growing group. People living by themselves, gone exponential. So now we're talking about a different housing type, which we're not, we're not supplying. And actually, older mature cities like New York and Boston and Philadelphia has always done this. It's just this is now, in a lot of communities, outright illegal to have a very small compact unit. You can't even apply for it. There is no permit that allows you in some cities to do what this group wants, which is if you go to the next. Um, and that's what we call microhousing or micro lofts, or it goes by some other terms. But it is very small, compact units that are anywhere from 200 square feet, if you can believe that, to 400 square feet. They are perfectly fine with that. Because unlike us, they don't sit around, watch TV, they don't do stuff at home, they do stuff out in the streets, in the cafes that you're talking about, in the bars, in the night plots, in the sidewalks. Those are their living rooms, just like they are in Europe. We are taking on more attributes of European cultures in that regard. Um, but they just, they're just looking for a safe, good, clean, protected place for basically to sleep and to occasionally cook, but rarely cook, because they're going to the food carts. <clears throat> now this, actually, the city of Seattle, despite New York's tremendous publicity on a single micro-housing project that isn't even built yet, we've been doing this in this city for the last five years, such that there are probably hundreds, if not approaching a thousand units that are all in that small, compact category. And I've taken the liberty of laying over our, our, our light rail system with our emerging streetcar system, and you can see the real estate industry responding before the system is even complete, because there's almost an exact congruence of the lines with the, the units that are being proposed or under construction or built or completed. And this is, a, this is sort of an, an example of one, as an architecture firm, we can't resist drawing. We're not just about policy, but we can't resist drawing. So this is an embodiment of this idea. Number one, and you alluded to this, the parking ratio is gone. You disaggregate the entitlement we've considered to be linking housing and the automobile. We just don't, we just take that out of the equation. If a developer wants to provide it, and this, you know, they do sometimes, but often those spaces aren't even leased. They're not interested in that stuff, as I said. So you don't need the parking. It just should be out of the equation. Then you can use the building envelope for all sorts of other things, common rooms, terraces, places that people want to have a good time socially and increase the density because they're very relatively small units, but all within a fairly modest, I mean, this could probably fit into most neighborhoods. It's not a tower. It's not an expensive form. This is stick-built housing, nothing outrageously expensive here, but it allows people to live, and we've thrown in some of sort of Pacific Northwest stuff too with windmills and rooftop gardens, and then there's a, there's a chicken coop on the top too. So. Yeah. So, so uh, Mark, is this just a fad? Do you think this no, is here no, to stay? No, actually, I th well, obviously, the, the boomer group is going to live for another 30 years, as I said. So that's, that's solid. The millennial group, I think, will pass on some of those attributes to the next group because values tend to do that. But I think they're certainly around for, in terms of having these different preferences for at least another decade. How controversial is this, working with Seattle and New York and other places? Yeah, people generally resist change. So it's almost always controversial, especially if you talk about getting rid of parking ratios. Great. And we're going we're gonna to hear from Rebecca Saldana here um, in a minute uh, on housing issues and social change. What is your opinion about low-income housing? Is this, is this part of the equation? Is this a solution? Well, I don't, I, you're using a very specific term, low-income housing, okay. and that always requires either a, a housing authority or a nonprofit to do to get down to true, the definition of low. But I think this is immensely applicable to below-market-rate housing, um, but not necessarily. I think it usually takes some other mechanisms to get low-income housing to actually thrive in, in an area, some intervention. Please text your uh, questions in for Mark. Any, any have come through? Okay. All right, this is a question for Mark uh, about baby boomers. What percentage do intend to age in place, and when will it tip so that the majority of older adults are living in cities? 
Um, well, actually, I, I don't know. I can't predict. I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball when, when the majority of adults will live in cities. But it's already beginning to happen. That, that is one of the groups. In fact, it's the first time in the history that people in their old, older years, 60 plus, and people in their 20s want the same thing. We've never had that before. We all want to be around cool stuff within walking distance. Neat stuff all the time, 24-7, cool stuff all the time. And that, those two groups are fueling this sort of resurgence of urban neighborhoods like we have never seen. It's not requiring sub deep subsidies to do that. It's not requiring redevelopment authorities. It's just the inevitability of demographic and social change, I would submit. Um, so I don't know, there was another part to that question, but I, now I don't remember what it was. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. Um, our next special guest today here at Revolution um, is the program director for Puget Sound Sage. Um, she has focused on labor, faith, and community issues as part of the mission of uh, the Sage organization. She has served with Congressman Jim McDermott and also has been organizing for United Farm Workers Housing, Women's Rights, and Transit. Thank you so much for being here. Rebecca, please welcome. So Rebecca, I pulled up this quote to start off our conversation and it says, the American suburb is no longer a refuge from poverty in the cities. Um, so do you have any, uh, any response to that? Sure, um, that would be a good place to start. Um, so um, as you said, my name is Rebecca Saldana. I work with um, Puget Sound Sage and we build coalitions of faith, labor, and community to advance um, policies and campaigns that allow um, families to thrive in their communities. And, and so part of that um, was last year we did a recent report on, on transit-oriented development that's healthy, green, and just, taking a look at the build-out of our light rail um, in, along the corridor between the airport and um, where we are right now, and downtown where eventually we'll have an expansion of our convention center. And as we're looking at the investment of light rail <laughs> and um, the impact on our communities, this one of the um, issues that we're always looking at is um, something that Claudia mentioned earlier is um, our communities getting priced out or are they able to actually root and, and the communities grow around um, those the communities that are already there and in our report what we what um, what everyone knows um, and what this uh, this quote alludes to is that um, when we're talking about growth um, and population growth and sustainability, a big question when we're looking at housing policies and transit is how are we capturing the growth, not just the current populations, but our future populations. And in the last decade, um, between, uh, between that, uh, 2000 and 2010 of our census data, what we noticed was something that was um, trending actually um, to be unsustainable, where over we had a huge population growth of immigrants people of color, color and refugees. And you would want, as a true transit advocate, to have most of that population right around where our investments are being made for light rail. And in part, that is happening, um, but it's not in our, in our or urban core. And um, where the population growth, over 47% 40 of the growth happened in outside of downtown, uh, outside of Seattle, in SeaTac, Tequila, Renton, and I wish I had my slides here, but um, those are, that's um, where our, our current light rail ends, is in SeaTac. And, and also in Rainier Valley, where the light rail is, you would hope again, that those are traditionally because of redlining and, and, um, and covenants uh, that um, limited where people of color, immigrants, and low-income people could find housing that was in Southeast Seattle, International District, Central District. And in those areas um, where we normally have people of color, we saw a very slow growth of communities of color based in comparison to um, the South King County. And even a slower population growth in Rainier Valley than in the rest of the city of Seattle. While at the same time, in South King, Co in King County, we had a decrease of our, our white populations by 2%. In um, Southeast Seattle, which is historically people of color, we saw an increase of white um, populations by over 13%. Yeah. Yeah. Rebecca, you bring such an interesting perspective, and you've been working for a long time as an activist. How did you make the link to 
to transportation and transit in particular? Sure. Um, so I am uh, one of the few um, Seattle uh, folks that was born and raised here. Um, and, but my, my po both my parents came from outside. Uh, my dad is from Mexico and grew up on the border of segregated Texas um, and came up to the Northwest as a farm worker at age 15 and found that here in this region there was opportunities for him. And um, it has been a part of what we love about um, Seattle is that this is a place of opportunity um, where people can um, succeed. And, and so I think how it came to transit is actually very strange. Um, really, my um, commitment has always been around um, bringing different people together. So my mother is from Ohio, uh, Mennonite um, farming community. Um, so we both have that rural connection and a, a deep commitment to um, sustainable agriculture, um, which includes starting with the people that harvest our food. Um, but I'm from Seattle. And so, you know, it's about, about consumers. It's about making sure um, that we're building a community where our farmlands can be strong and, can, and the beauty of, my, of Mount Rainier. If it, hopefully you guys have had a chance to get out of the building um, and see some of the beauty that surrounds us. I mean, it's that beauty that surrounds us, those mountains that surround us that really limit where growth can happen. And so making sure that um, I, don't, I, I want my children, and one of my children is um, living in microhousing. It's called University of Washington dorms. Um, <laughs> and he is definitely of that millennial age. But I also have two young um, biracial children that are mine um, that I'm raising. One's one, one is four. We live in Rainier Beach, uh, which is um, the very edge of the city of Seattle. Um, we're hanging on by threads to stay in our city limits. And, um, but when, when I moved there, there was a lot of um, elderly um, folks that had worked in public sector, that had worked for Boeing. And um, what was a challenge for me is I was seeing them um, living there, they're growing old in their homes, and they're having a hard time maintaining their homes, but their children are not living in the neighborhood. Their children are living outside of Seattle. And I do not want that to be the case for my children. I want them to be able to afford and be part of where the investments are happening. So is microhousing part of that equation? What's your opinion on, on that? Microhousing is not new. It's called SROs. And they were throughout the Seattle. You could walk out right, right here and see in Belltown, there were dozens and dozens of SROs. They were raised those populations that live there are living in our tent cities. We have about five tent cities happening right now in the city limits, including um, as a, one of our board members of our organization is a housing developer. She has families, a multi what she calls a multiracial refugee camp on 23rd and Jackson right now. She, I was in a meeting with her and she had to step up and step out to take a call from a refugee family from East Africa that um, was there with their children. These tent cities have children living them right now. And, and yet those SROs were um, replaced with luxury condos, with high-end apartments that um, are, are great, um, but are not part of the solution. So a single resident um Stay, uh, single, single that? room occupancy. Single room occupancy. And they were basically, you know, you have, they're dorm like. They're very similar to the micro housing. Um, what's different, and, and then in South Seattle, in my communities, the Latino community, um, we've been doing micro housing for generations. It's called overcrowding um, of apartments. And, and so I think that it's, it's great now. Um, developers have found a way to make it profitable. Um, but it's not going to be what, what allows, what, it's not going to capture the full growth. Um, you know, and so it, I'm not saying that it, it can't be helpful, but it's definitely not a public benefit. It's a benefit to the private developers that have found a way to make a buck and, and provide a need for the market, which is great. I mean, that's part of what it is, but it's not getting to our comp plan. It's not getting to actually capturing growth and making our transit investments um, ones that are really going to create truly sustainable um, and, and places of opportunity. You're so vocal on the Tiodu front here in the Puget Sound region. Um, 
what's missing? What's missing in the planning process and in dealing with agencies and, and you know, technicians in this field? What would you like to see to come more broadly to the table in the discussion of transit and TOD? I mean, I think what's, what's missing, um, one of them is jobs. And um, our uh, city council member from Shoreline that has been sitting with me from this growing transit communities, which is a HUD grant um, to do planning for the build out of our, the rest of our light rail, you know, he was very vocal. He told our, um, our MPO our, that um, it's been really helpful, this whole process, the tools that um, you know, our regional planning um, body has been providing, but he would love to see more about jobs. And that's something that I think um, Puget Sound Sage and our national affiliates um, called Partnership for Working Families has really been on the cutting edge of looking at, in order for transit to work, it has to be half about you know, the place. You know, the, the housing, the cultural anchors, the things that we're building, and the other part about the jobs. And so right now we have, um, our light rail goes to two job centers. SeaTac, which is, um, has thousands and thousands of jobs that are publicly um, invested from our tax dollars, and the majority of them are part-time, minimum wage, no benefits. And so um, it, it's looking at living wage. Um, and we have an active living wage campaign happening in the city of SeaTac. On the other hand, it's looking at downtown Seattle. So for every great Amazon job in South Lake Union, there's also going to be a dozen service sector jobs that come from that, including at um, the Greyhound, our old Greyhound station, Legacy Transit, um, is going to be replaced with a mega hotel um, that will include thou over a thousand jobs. The majority of those will be housekeeper jobs, and the current um, owner developer um, is looking at having those be as low road as possible, and um, and including some housing on site, but housing that wouldn't that none of those people that are doing those jobs for him would be able to afford. And so it's it's really looking at like how do we um, look at street vacation like Seattle? We do not have or in Washington we don't have TIF, we don't have value capture currently, <laughs> um, but we do have some amazing. Um, land use policy discussions going on right now about in how to look at citywide inclusionary housing or incentive zoning and looking at our, the use of um, our street vacations. So to be able to make that mega hotel happen, um, they're needing um, the public to vacate a street, um, an alleyway to be able to help make that work. And so how do we connect real public benefit and real conversations um, out of the box thinking um, that connects and makes that TOD really come together. Excellent response. Talking. Let's take some questions from the audience. Elizabeth? Um, there was a question about uh, a number of major corporations are moving their headquarters back in the cities, uh, largely um, in response, at least the um, anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence is in response to the millennials wishing to work downtown. Um, do you see a lot of evidence for this and is this an answer for getting more high quality jobs in the urban core? Who's that going to? Um, <laughs> we're experiencing some of that change in what we're calling the Silicon Valley and the beach, uh, Venice Beach area. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're definitely, um, ha we have Google there, we have uh, YouTube um, companies coming in there, so all of those are promoting all of these high, you know, tech uh, jobs. And very soon what we see happening is the attraction of those really high paying jobs are going to start pushing eastward because people again in Santa Monica, Venice area, west side Los Angeles area, prices there for housing are extremely high already. Um, so where are they gonna be coming? So what we have in the city of LA, which is substantially large, um, 464 square miles, you have the West LA area, you have downtown, which is a major job center, and then you have part of South LA that has the largest employer in, the, in Los Angeles in the way of USC. Um, and then you have the uh, Warner Center in the Valley. Those are your major, major job centers. And so the transit is actually connecting to all of those. And the transit is coming to um, the beach area in about three, three years by 2017, right? So we have to put those measures, land use measures, policies right now. And so, so that's why um, doing the, the transit um, planning that's taking place along the Expo Line 2 
is critically, critically important to consider job growth and to consider um, equitable development mm -hmm. in those areas. Yeah, just to uh, extend that a little bit, I think actually the more interesting story is not the big corporations that are the name brands, but all the startups that are happening. And those are happening in urban areas because they want just basic, funky space that's kind of raw and nobody else sort of much wants that. They're older, leftover, older stock of class B, class B, class C buildings. And that's, I think, a far more engaging and interesting story of the next Microsoft or the next Amazon or the next Yahoo or the next Google. Those are where those are being born. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, I think um, both um, Bill Gates Sr. and his son um, speak really clearly to um, they were able to succeed in large part because of where investments were made. So whether, I mean, what I've come to understand is that a lot of my consumer choices about like where I chose to live were less about really knowing and really about where investments had been made and where there was housing affordable in my range. And so I think millennials, I think, are really responding more to the fact that there's a GMA and um, that developers are not able just to develop wherever anymore. I mean, they've lost, they've, there's no land. So it's really all, the money is in making redevelopment and revi revitalization. And so because of that um, interest, that's always been a huge influencer on how transit and where the investments, where public investments get made. And as a result, that's where things are happening. So if you want to be able to be the next startup, you're gonna go where there's already infrastructure set up. And it's less about because millennials really have a different value about it. It's more, they're part, they are part of their environment. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is really something that I'm starting to learn and really understand more and more is that, you know, our, our kids, our food, you know, it's, it's all um, very much responding to the environment we create. And we all in this room, and this is what's really exciting about this session, is we have the opportunity and the responsibility to create an environment for our gener next generation to be able su to succeed. And I think one thing that I've heard from um, some of our, you know, my elders is that they feel in large part um, that maybe they failed, you know, the current generation because there's a pipeline, a much stronger, clear pathway to prison, to dropping out, um, to not being able to um, be the next entrepreneur um, for our resident born um, youth, right? Which is why so many of these high quality jobs are not going to youth that have been educated in this system, in this school system. Well, thank you, such provocative and very educational questions. But, but please let us know um, how we can help you in integrating better the issues that you brought up today. They're just so important. Let's give a great round of applause to our first panel here at Revolution. Thank you so much. So we're going to move on to our next three panelists here today. Um, and so we have the planning lead uh, for the Puget Sound region for David Evans and Associates. Uh, he also served as the executive director for the New Zealand Planning Association. Welcome, Keith Hall. Thank you. Yeah. Well, given uh, Mark's definition of a millennial and packing up and moving around the world and living in small spaces, I think I should have been a millennial, but I might have missed that mark by a year or two, um, or 10. Or <laughs> um, I wanted to run through a little bit of a presentation and just think about where we were um, 30 years ago and where we might be 30 years from now. Um, 30 years ago, I, most of you are my age, I think, um, looking at the audience, but uh, if, you're, if you're my age or older, you'll think about where we were 30 years ago. Um, you sent letters to family in these little quaint things called envelopes you licked a stamp, and you hope it got there in a week or two or three. Uh, <laughs> we didn't email each other. We didn't have the internet yet. Um, certainly it was, it was framed out uh, in 1983. Uh, the technical standards were outlined that year, um, but we weren't users. Uh, your cell phone. There, there was a cell phone in 1983. It was the first handheld cell phone that was produced. I think it was about the size of a two-liter bottle of, of Coke. Um, it was not something you put in your pocket. It took 10 hours to charge, and you could use it for up to an hour. Um, and it didn't really do much that cell phones do today. Uh, coffee. 
Uh, Starbucks hadn't served its first latte yet. It did exist, but that was the year that one of its founders went off to Italy and decided to change their business model into what we know today. Um, and if you haven't been to one of the 20,000 Starbucks uh, lately, um, you probably don't know how successful they've been. You might, actually. Um, your home computer, if you had one, just think about the Apple Lucy was out at this time. Um, it was about $10,000. The Mac hadn't really made its uh, mark yet, quite yet. Um, you could get a cheaper model for around $3,000 in 1983 dollars, by the way. Uh, it didn't have a hard drive. You had to use floppy disks. Does anybody run, remember what those are? Um, transportation, you drove. Um, transit cycling and walking were people who, for people who couldn't. 84% of the people of, tra of trips made in 1983 uh, were pr by private vehicle. Uh, we're actually 1% down from that today, but I'll make the point that it reached 89% in 1995, and we are at least on the better side of that trend this time around. Um, one of the interesting things I found about the cell phone in 1983, it was, uh, it was the Dynatac 8000X, and the car, one of the cars I picked out was the Pontiac 6000. <laughs> All of these probably should have been version 1. Uh, we certainly have a different view of marketing today as well. When we think about transit, um, you know, transit is integral to our cities, um, but we really haven't changed much about transit. A lot of cities have light rail system, and it is fantastic. We've added, uh, I think in 1983, we had three LR modern LRT systems in North America. They were in, two were in Canada, one in San Diego. We, we, of course, had the legacy systems in Boston and San Francisco uh, on top of that. But in terms of new systems, Portland was really it's in its first year of, of building its LRT system. Uh, Vancouver, British Columbia was uh, in its first year of building its first SkyTrain line. Seattle was, was making its decision on the bus tunnel, which is now part of the, the LRT system. But it wasn't really broadly across the U.S. Um, and transit was still largely a novelty. We were still trying to figure out how to keep it from dying. But people that are younger than me, and certainly, and actually me for the last four years living in Toronto, I, I've interacted with the city in a very different way, and I enjoy it, even though I'm old, um, or at least middle-aged. And I think a lot of people in that, in that kind of condition can live and interact in a city in a very different way. They see it, they realize it. But our plans, our zoning codes haven't been updated in many cities since before the millennials were born. The way we think about transit delivery in many cities, the bus systems in particular, the connections they make to our emerging rail systems hasn't fundamentally changed in the last 30 years. And it's up to us going forward to really start taking some of those actions. Seattle will spend the next five years updating its art outdated zoning code. Five years to update a zoning code, perhaps we've made it a little too complicated um, and should simplify it. This is a picture I took, and I'm sorry for the blurriness, but it was with a cell phone. <laughs> And um, not, not the old, well, it was probably a Blackberry, an older Blackberry. Um, but this is in Santiago. It's the subway system. If you've never been to Santiago, um, my guess is they didn't hire a value engineer when they did the uh, design of the system. Um, it has fantastic artwork. It has, this is in the concourse level of the subway station. And people just use this in, you know, as an impromptu space. You know, it's a fantastic space. Um, Today, we often value engineer spaces like this out of transit, which is kind of, I understand why, but it's unfortunate. And then looking at what we know today, um, you know, I, I'll go back a little bit. D did everybody have CompuServe at some point in their life? No, yeah. <laughs> um, no if you didn't, you're probably young. Um, you know, your smartphone, which do you, does anybody, does everybody still have a home phone at, at this point in time? Who has a home phone in the audience? I mean, well, you know, almost, almost half almost of you half still have a home phone. Uh, who uses it? I, I, <laughs> Very few. One Very person few uses it. Here. Actually, uh, two, two people use it. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I haven't even had a home phone in years. I've had a VoIP service that I use and plug in, but it's not a traditional true landline. Just to comment, I just recently read an article about training for younger folks coming into jobs that need to use a phone. I'm you know, not like, like actually how to dial without <laughs> using your digital plan. A dial. Yes, yes. It's a, it's, wow. it's a, it's a, new, it's a new business. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, you know, and computers are also on the decline. Our, our phones and our tablets actually do as much, if not more, than computers. And I can certainly speak to my work computer, which weighs about seven tons. It's about the size, it's a laptop. 
uh, and is enormous. But you know, you can get away with a tablet, go take notes, check emails uh, just as easily, or your phone. And uh, yet, the thing that we haven't really changed that much, you know, younger generation is driving less, but VMT is still probably in a pretty bad place. Our awareness of what we're doing to the global environment is certainly in a different place today than what it was in 30 years ago. Um, are we changing that fast enough? Uh, I guess is my key question. And is that um, final? Oh, okay. Um, I'd like to think about where we're going in, in 2043. You know, if you looked at our, the way we planned in 1983 and you, you told people people would have phones that pretty much were out of Star Trek, nobody would believe you. Uh, we look, technology is moving faster. Our progression down this road of society is going much faster. Cities look diff are starting to look different. The way people interact with them look different. How effective are we in planning for 30 years from now if we're still stuck in some of the decisions we've made 30 years ago and, and haven't changed the way we plan highway systems? We're still building highways in a lot of places. Um, we're still running the same transit networks in places. The zoning codes still don't provide the kind of housing I want, much less the next generation, frankly. Um, so we have to think about th those things going forward. And this is actually, I, I love this photo, it's, or this image. It's, uh, it's a 1950s view of what um, I think 2000 would be uh, from this image. And there are pedestrians, but it wasn't a very walkable place, and I can't imagine having an A380 running right down the corridor of the buildings. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of moving around, and I think in, going forward, we need to think a lot less about mobility than about how people interact with the city. Absolutely. Text your questions to 213-703-5491 for Keith Hall. Um, Keith, how quickly, in your opinion, you've worked in New Zealand and Toronto, you're doing work in, um, based out of here in the Puget Sound now, how quickly is planning keeping up with, with these changes? And, and what, what do we need to do? Um, I, we could do better. Um, the Seattle Com uh, Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance was last updated in 1982. Um, they are looking at a project to update it again. There are some cities that are living, in fact, actually, I would say most cities are living under comprehensive zoning ordinances that are much older. And you think about you know the 1940s. I, there are a lot, I think LA's is, is current, yeah, is currently in the 1940s. So, how if if we're designing buildings and car, you know the parking requirements that are tied into that, the assumptions about what families are that get tied into that, the assumptions about what people's expectations in housing is from 1940 to today, I I can't imagine wanting to buy a. I am just glad we don't have actual designs written into our codes because nobody would want any of those houses. We have to work harder at changing those quick, more quickly and more frequently to respond to the market. And I don't think we're doing a very good job at that. Keith, uh, what is your hope for future generations in terms of how they live in the US? I'm going to go with one of the last speakers' um, comment that the previous generation may have failed our generation. And I'm going to hope that we don't leave that legacy with the next one. And, and do you think we can do that? You think that I think if we if we get to work and we recognize that we need to start making some changes, we we can do it. But we could also get deadlocked like uh, a certain level of government that I won't mention, and never make any progress at all. Yes, <laughs> but, but but thank you for the good ideas, and we're we're about you know creating new ideas and moving things Absolutely. forward. Do you have a, another question? <laughs> Questions are coming in. Luke that's trying to keep up. Well, one thing I'll add to it, I mean, you look at the way people use streets today, you look, in, in particular around the world, Europe, Asia, we actually, we've, we have a very, very car-centric streets. We don't really accommodate transit very well on them, but we certainly don't, don't accommodate people on them very well. And our codes really reinforce that behavior, the way we design streets, the way we use them, and we need to start thinking about some of those changes as well, and we need to, we need to keep up. 
Yes. So there's another question about um, some people are feeling like Gen X is not being heard. Um, so uh, there was a question about um, we've talked quite a bit about baby boomers and the millennials and their housing desires and needs. And perhaps Gen X um, could be an indicator of a happy medium or something that the millennials may be desiring in the near future. Well, I mean, I would look at my own example. I think numerically I'm in Gen X. I'm not sure what that means in this context. I feel sometimes maybe like I should have been a Gen, Gen Y person. Um, I, you know, I'm very content with a townhouse in the city, and you wouldn't believe how many cities in this country that is almost impossible to find. Um, you can't find a small lot. I don't like mowing. I hate, I hate yards. I don't know why people enjoy mowing a yard. That just... <laughs> Does anybody, act, who here enjoys mowing their yard? <laughs> okay, a handful. A handful. Um, I hate it, you know, I despise it. And yet that's what's available. And I don't think we've done a great job at addressing truly the kinds of housing that everybody does want. Excellent, well, thank you so much, Keith. We're gonna move on to our next panelist here. We have the Assistant Community Director, Development Director from Azusa, California. He represents a small town undergoing tremendous uh, change uh, from gentrification, economic development, and great impacts from transit. Let's welcome Connell McNamara. Thank you, good to see you. So, Connell, you have some slides here to set the context for actually my hometown what are you in Southern California. Me with? Yeah. Ah, there it is. Uh, I actually found this slide in, in preparation for this, and it's uh, it's an actual train crash from 1922. I, I'm hoping uh, uh, in our city, as we move forward with uh, two light rail stations and, and the terminus of what we call the Gold Line, uh, we do a much better job than uh, what you saw back in 1922. And I think just touching on what I think a couple of people have said uh, in terms of, of what we leave to the future generations, uh, I'll go briefly here today because I think Diego has a lot to say, but uh, we're going to be a case study that I hope everybody will have a chance to watch over the next few years. Uh, we're a, a small city, uh, kind of in the middle of Los Angeles County, which has uh, 88 cities ranging in population from a little over 4 million in the city of Los Angeles all the way down to uh, 114 people in the city of Vernon, which is a little fun fact if you're, a, if you're nerdy as far as population data. But uh, we do have two Gold Line stations coming along the way, and uh, we were very successful in obtaining a, a metro grant to do a quarter mile radius study around both of them. And it's going to be a very exciting time over the next uh, two years or so as we do that planning and map out where we go. Uh, this is uh, our current Santa Fe Depot, which uh, I think was last prominent in, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, not much done since. I believe it's owned by Metro, and we're in discussions with Metro right now to uh, perhaps take that over and rehab it. And I know we're looking to do uh, some bicycle-related uses in there and to truly, really try to make this uh, an integral part of, of what we see as our downtown station, which is immediately adjacent. Uh, it's not built yet, but it's, it's going to be built immediately adjacent. Uh, here we are. Uh, you can see the large swaths of graded area, which might uh, disturb some, but that is the uh, Rosedale community where Zafar lives. So if, if, uh, if you want to get the skinny on, on uh, how he feels, uh, that's, uh, that's our newest community, 1,250 units, uh, really a, a donut hole in the middle of an established community. Uh, Azusa was uh, incorporated in 1898. Uh, this 1,250 unit subdivision uh, marks, a new, uh, marks a new direction as far as uh, socioeconomics and the gentrification that's going on along with another community that's kind of off the map. We have uh, just points of interest on here. The two stars are going to be the Gold Line stations. Uh, we have Azusa Pacific University and Citrus College that you see highlighted in purple and green, respectively. They add about uh, 25,000 students uh, during the nine months. This is to year. a town of about 50,000 people. It's about 40, 47,000. Yeah. So I mean, it really does. Uh, there's a lot of dynamics here. I've highlighted in blue the uh, city's parks, and in red you see the actual transit routes from Foothill Transit, which is our uh, bus service provider. So these are all going to be things we're talking about over the next couple of years of how do we integrate all of these together, capitalize on the, uh, the college students and community college students, university students, community college students, uh, be able to make transit more accessible to our community through parks uh, and certainly our community uh, in the future as these kids graduate and hopefully want to buy 
uh, housing in the future in the city of Azusa. Uh, this is just, uh, I, I like this slide. This is our downtown. You can see again the red star in the middle uh, uh, talks about, uh, is our gold line station. I think it, when I first looked at it, we have 11 different zones within a quarter mile. I'm not so sure that works out well for transit-oriented development. That's something we're certainly going to be looking at as we uh, kick off this effort to do a, a good TOD analysis and hopefully try to stimulate some, some upzoning and some, some density changes to really promote what we should be doing, which is uh, looking at this whole quarter-mile area holistically. Connell, you mentioned that as you said, is a really great case study for the for the audience here, and I, w I would agree. That's a small town in Los Angeles County, uh, potentially uh, greatly affected um, in terms of social change and reform, um, and and opportunities um, as well as impacts from Measure R. Can you tell us how the Los Angeles County program implemented by LA Metro? Um, is really impacting your city and the planning and the social fabric? I think having the gold line come through Azusa has been fabulous, wonderful. Some cities along the gold line uh, didn't want a station. We wanted to. We happen to be the terminus of the line, uh, so that I'm sure that's going to present challenges with, in terms of parking and, and other issues, but uh, it's been a great working relationship with the uh, construction authority. Uh, we've already partnered with Metro and Foothill Transit to build a, uh, to improve, it's not built yet, but we just entitled it a 550 space structure right adjacent to the uh, downtown station. So that'll give us 200 spaces for Metro riders, 200 spaces for Foothill Transit, which is going to be the bus terminal coming in, and then 150 bonus spaces for the city, which hopefully we'll be able to use as we develop in and around that area to be able to relax some of the parking requirements. Uh, Azusa was recently highlighted in a series of articles in the New York Times. Um, and, and they re reference the middle class nature historically of Azusa uh, in the San Gabriel Valley and the contrast to other cities um, around. And they, and they reference Bradbury, uh, one of the most affluent enclaves in the United States, about a mile away recently, a household for $78 million. And they're really talking about the change of uh, suburbanization um, in the inner core close to a city with transit investment and what's that's what what that is doing to the community um, as well as the fear of potential displacement of uh, you know established um, neighborhoods there are families that have been living there for generations any comments on that well I, I I actually read that article I found it to be very interesting what strikes me about Azusa and I've been there a little over five years <laughs> people really take pride in the number of generations that their families have lived in Azusa. And it's, it's a very interesting scenario because uh, somebody who recently ran for council unsuccessfully told me that when they knocked on doors, the first question was, how long have you lived here? And when they said 17 years, they said that's not long enough and they slammed the door in their face. So what we have is we have a really entrenched pride in Azusa, which is going to have an interesting uh, dynamic when you look at the new uh, residents moving in in some of the areas in the north part of the city and how that is going to shake out over the next 10 to 15 years when we see this build out is going to be quite interesting but it's uh, there certainly is a gentrification afoot uh, and I think it's going to uh, call into question uh, Azusa Unified School District some of the education programs going on uh, but I think the light rail line going through is going to be the one unifying theme that's going to allow people to be closer to Pasadena. We're about, if you've heard of Pasadena, we're about 15 minutes outside Pasadena. It's these type of uh, things that are going to become closer to home for those people who have been longtime residents generation-wise in, in Azusa to be able to get on the rail and see a different part of LA County and conversely hopefully have people come to Azusa live in Azusa where they can perhaps pay less rent, pay less of a mortgage, but still be able to work in the downtown core or in some of the other job centers that I think some of the previous speakers have discussed. So there's been a history in Azusa of, you know, tension between different groups and different interests. And now with, with Rosedale, a very high-end, very large-scale development, middle of Los Angeles County, changing demographics, um, how, how will the city and how are you going to contribute to resolving um, issues in terms of needs and desires and the opportunity for transit-oriented development in the city? Well, I'm hoping a lot of that is accomplished through the TOD study with the grant we receive. Uh, a big part of it has been uh, 
to be able to focus money towards uh, an economic analysis of what is all this going to mean. I don't know if you have the slide uh, where we show. Uh, there's a slide I have. Within this area here, uh, the city actually has, I would say, six or seven substantial land holdings uh, that we acquired through redevelopment before in the state of California redevelopment was basically terminated in 2012. We still have those holdings. I think uh, your question is a good one. We're not sure. Uh, I, I want to make sure that we do a thorough analysis when we go through this effort uh, through Metro to make sure that we not only are, are setting up a good plan for the area around here, but making sure that the properties we control are used in a sensible way to promote transit-oriented development because I think we have to walk the walk more so than talk the talk and we're in a great position to do that given the fact that we have such sizable holdings within a quarter mile radius. Great. Elizabeth, a question from the audience. Yes. Um, so there's, this is a question about how do we get our political leaders who may be focused only on the next two or three years, the next election, to see further down the road, make decisions now that won't let Gen Y, Gen X, and others down? I, I think education. I think. Uh, I think conferences like Revolution do a great job of that, but it really boils down to design. Uh, I mean, I have to say, in, in Azusa, there is a perception that density is bad because some of the some of the projects we've seen over time, candidly, were bad. Um, that is no longer the case, and I think you can control for density and things like parking through quality design. And really, at the end of the day, that's what people are going to want to see. We recently. Uh, partnered with uh, Mercy Housing to do an affordable project, very low and low, uh, which I was shocked we had buy-in from the city council because of the quality of the design and they knew this area that we were coming into was in bad shape. We bought a number of properties there, we knocked them down, and we were moving down that path to really do a comprehensive seven-acre redevelopment effort. And it really was about the design that sold them, and I think, I, I think that's where we're going in the future. Excellent. So we're, uh, please text your questions in. So we're going to move on to our grand finale, and it really is. We have the executive director at LA Metro Transit Agency. Um, he's also served as a city of LA planning commissioner. Um, he's a fellow Bruin from UCLA, uh, like me, and uh, he's on the board of LA Art Walk and a very distinguished artist in the LA area. Welcome to Diego Cardosa. Well, thank you for the enthusiasm, and I'm, I'm very glad that I'm last because I heard everything and I know what not to say now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go. To, so basically, I'm going to tell you a little very short story, way, very quickly. This is the, uh, what used to exist in Los Angeles um, in the 20s and 30s. Uh, trolleys going everywhere. And the trolleys were sort of the uh, system that created, that laid the groundwork for the city in terms of what you know now. Now, when you go to Southern California, there are 89 cities in LA County. So when I use the word LA city, I'm referring to the idea of Los Angeles. It's, it's, it's that vast expense. Um, you can see that this transportation system is basically covering uh, most of the county. And that was the foundation for that built environment then. It was a built it was a transportation system that was basically carrying a lot of pedestrians into the destinations where they were going or where they're going for business, etc. This is kind of the, 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 the mobility system that inspired other things in, in the county. How you build the things, how you design the streets, the experience of people with the city was basically an experience of people walking to the, the train or the bus and going places. Uh, this generated a lot of buildings with uh, practically no parking. This generated uh, the idea of mixed use, which is First floor used for stores, and for the landlords that was a good thing because they could get a rent and then on the floors above you have housing. Uh, most of the housing was very compact. Uh, so mobility started sort of creating the spaces that we lived in that later on will create us as human beings in terms of how we relate to the city and others, etc. Let's go to the next. 
basically, here I'm showing you uh, in the slide that uh, illustrates what the MTS committed in terms of transit investment based on Measure R. Measure R is that a local initiative that asks us, the live in the county, can you pay an additional half percent tax every time you buy something uh, in order to go into a transportation system. This is what we are committed doing it, and uh, we're supposed to finish this in 20, uh, 2030, 2028. Uh, as you can see, we are going back to the future. Going back to the future. That's, please understand that. It's very, very important to, to, to. Um, let me tell you a little story in between the stories here, is that in 1878, 1878, Southern Pacific, link uh, California, Los Angeles, to the rest of the United States. Uh, 10,000 people live in what's now known uh, Greater Los Angeles, 10,000 people. By the time that we had the previous slide there that I show you, the, 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 the trolleys, half a million people live in, in uh, the city, half a million. 10,000, half a million. They were not born there. They came from somewhere. Uh, in the United States, we are all immigrants. In the United States, we, always, uh, we are always traveling. We're always moving. We're always thinking and converting ourselves or, or, or doing something else. So mobility is not only the movement, but it's our ability to understand where we are and how we move mentally as well as physically. And then I don't know if you heard the presentation this morning from, uh, it was a doctor or something that made a very interesting presentation about the relationship, the brain and, 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 and health. Uh, it is extremely, extremely important to understand that relationship. And in the 21st century, I think most of the cities in the world, the greatest urban cities in the world, are gonna be facing the same issues that we are facing here and in, in, in Los Angeles, excuse me, in, 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 the, in the major cities in the United States, which is the inability to uh, build a more sustainable, livable urban environment. Most people live now in urban environments. And, and we really need to transform, we really need to create the, the infrastructure, we need to create the cultural basis of that infrastructure that we need to create we need to be able to think about the next generations and how we are going to endow them with the ability for them to keep going. We need to do that. So, so this is a photograph of basically what we did here. I also oversee the active transportation in, for, the count, for, the, for the MTA, which is basically bicycles and walking. <laughs> And then what we did here is basically highlight the number of stations in that transit system. And by the way, this transit system, system here is the core. You have here also buses, you have shuttles, other things. So it's filled with stuff. So basically here, what you see here is a one mile radius around one of those uh, transit nodes, stations. Uh, let's go, go back to Los Angeles is a very relatively flat environment. Most of the days in the year are very, you don't need to change your clothes a lot. You can go out there on, on December or you can go out there in July and then maybe you take your jacket and then you go out there. You don't have to change your shoes, you don't have to, if you have kids you don't have to change totally everything they do because they're gonna freeze outside. You don't do that. So it's an environment that it's great to be indoors or outdoors. It's an environment that it's easily accessible through a bicycle or walking. So it's a no-brainer that they, as much as we have uh, committed to an investment of $30 billion between now and 2030, that we need to invest in active transportation, bicycles, walking. We need to deal with the issues of mobility from that perspective. We need to come up with different approaches to land use. I've been sitting, I've been a member of the LA City Planning Commission for almost eight years, and I just concluded my, my, my appointment there with a new mayor. And then most of the stuff that we dealt with was infill development. 
readaptation of buildings, readaptation of communities. Most of the work was that. So that is a, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to work for Metro and to have given the responsibility to deal with walking and bicycling because I think the, the challenges for the 21st century, even though that they are very simple, they're difficult to accomplish because they're ingrained in the culture of people and our expectations. We no longer see the way we probably would have seen many years ago when we were walking most of the time or when we were going places in, 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 in other than the automobile we would drive. So the cultural shift, it's very difficult. And, and, but it needs to be done, and, 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 and it's happening, and it's the younger generations that are making that happen. Uh, someone mentioned here about micro-housing. Micro-housing is a great thing. Don't only look at it from the perspective of, of, oh my God, this is a developer that is coming up and make a profit. Micro-housing is needed in order for half people. Everybody needs to be a little, we don't wanna segregate the city anymore Cities have been segregated in many, many ways. We need to have people living that, that work in the service sector, younger people, older people, retirees, in those places that are desirable. This last slide basically deals with one of the issues that appears now in the, in the 21st century. I need a little water, but I'm getting there. Uh, which is that in the case of the city of Los Angeles and many other cities in the United States, these are no longer cities that exist within the boundaries of the United States or California or, or, or Washington State. These are global cities. These are global cities that are encountering other problems, which is global warming, uh, changes in the environment in terms of the air, the air we breathe, et cetera. So we gotta deal with that issue. We gotta lower, reduce the footprint in the terms of carbon emissions. That's a very important issue and that's something that also I have to oversee in terms of the sustainability program for transportation in LA Metro. I think that's the last slide, correct? Great. So, you know, Los Angeles, like in, in so many fronts, is, is a great example given its magnitude in terms of, um, you know, social change and urban planning. Um, back in the 90s, um, one of the areas north of Los Angeles and in, in, in Palmdale had a huge, in Santa Clarita Valley, had a uh, a huge boom in residential and then a bust. And there was a lot of attention played to the link to transportation and social aspects. There's a community, middle class, upper middle class, um, areas with a long commute that suddenly we saw um, gang activity, we saw latchkey kids, we saw um, absentee parents who were commuting hours to get back and forth to Los Angeles. Um, that was an interesting lesson. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the importance of transportation in relationship to social needs and, and the long-term viability of Los Angeles? Uh, okay, uh, that is a situation which basically says that uh, in order for you to afford housing, you gotta drive far enough until you can afford and qualify. And, and, and we gotta, that is a terrible situation because the affordability of housing then becomes a very expensive exercise and moving and going there. You have to pay for your gas. You are not there when you're needed for, for younger people, the generations. You are not there to participate in, 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 in the public realm. That's a valuable element of, of a society. If we cannot get along with others, we are losing a lot. It's very valuable. So, so because the expenses will be of policing and, and building uh, fortresses, et cetera, et cetera. So, so a, a, a livable community needs to bring together where you work, where you go to school, where you have fun and all of those as much as possible. So the solutions of, of, of the work, workforce, those that are working in the service industry, those that are younger people, they need to be housed. They need to be, so we need to produce the housing also for them in some fashion, so that's a very, very important. And then a recent University of Pennsylvania study on Los Angeles stated that um, mixed-use housing in Los Angeles reduces crime. Do you agree? Well, you know, um, uh, it's not a question of agreeing. I think that you're happier anywhere where you are. You're probably gonna be a little more healthier. 
it's not it's not only you know the the happiness has a lot to do with 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 well-being, and and then and then um, more livable cities are cities that can produce that for for most of us. Let's remember that in the 21st century, um, the maladies that we cannot control well are those related to the brain, are those related to mental illness, to the inability of people to make friends, the inability of children to make friends, or, or people being afraid of others. Those are not things that you're going to correct by going to a doctor or a hospital or, or taking a medicine. So, so you got to build a, a healthier environment. you got to have a more livable city. And, and, and that's, that's probably what's going to resolve some of those issues. We're going to take some questions from the audience. But first, we're going to do a trivia question. Where's uh, Alex, our prize guy? Right, last chance for sustenance. Uh, <laughs> last trivia question. Uh, a one-point increase in the walk score was associated with an increase in, I'm assuming, housing value, uh, ranging from A, $152, B, Two hundred to seven hundred dollars, or C, seven hundred to three thousand dollars. Where are you from? Where are you from? Kansas City. All right, that's correct. Thank you. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have some questions, Elizabeth, from the audience. At, at one point, LA had the largest, or one of the largest, streetcar interurbans in the world. Are some of the new routes copying those same lines so that, of the old Pacific Electric? Yes, because uh, the uh, county MTA purchased uh, the right-of-ways uh, from the different uh, companies that own those right-of-ways. So you will be seeing sort of like that's what I said, we're going back to the future in some ways. So the answer is yes. How do environmental issues such as climate change play into the plans of transportation for future generations? A huge, a huge. Uh, the air you breathe, it's a very important factor. One, two, the expenses on, on, on the indirect cost by, by not having a, a, a more healthier environment. Those are the expenses that you're gonna pay either through uh, healthcare or having to uh, provide for your children from, from far away and then childcare and all of that. So it's, it's a, it's a very significant uh, area. Well, thank you. Well, great food for thought today from all of our panelists. As a member of the National Steering Committee, I want to thank you for participating in our new format, and thank you to all of our panelists today and our assistants, Elizabeth and Alex. Thank you. Have a great day.